Lesson 79, moving sound. We will be able to explain how a sound wave moves. So what we're going to do today is we're going to explore how a sound wave exists, how it moves, how it moves around objects, how fast it moves, all of these things. We're pretty much going to cover all of the starting things about modeling sound. We should be able to pretty much finish all of modeling sound by the end of this week. That's my goal. So let's start off with we, how do we explain sound waves. Before we do that, let's talk about what we talked about last time. So last time, I'm pretty much going to cover all of this stuff by the end of this week. So that's the goal. Maybe this last one, maybe not, because this last one's a bit complicated, but we'll figure that out. Um, firstly, I've also broken this up into two pages because in the part in last week I didn't like it. Like last lesson didn't like how all this information was all bunched up in one. But yeah, a wave can be described as a disturbance that travels through medium, medium from one location to another location. Mediums like solid, liquid, or gases, and waves allow energy to move from one place to another. If you drop a rock into a Oh, let me use a different color. Let me use blue because it's a rock. It's a pool of water. Oopsies. If I have a pool of water and I drop a rock into that pool, then that will create that will create water waves. And these water waves will go out and as ripples and will carry this energy in the form of a wave. And that wave can uh, can move something. So if you've got a little toy boat at the edge of the lake, that's going to get pushed because of the energy. And that's going to do work um, by applying a force over a distance. And so yeah, that's how you can tell that a wave carries energy. And it has to travel through a medium, unless it's light. Light doesn't need a medium. But yeah, the medium in this case is water. And that's what we started. First thing is first is I guess was, what I should have done is talked about what a wave is. And then once we talk about what a wave is, we can talk about what sound. A sound wave is, yeah, is just like a water wave, but it's a vibration in the air or other things as well. It moves in acoustic longitudinal wave. Sound moves one um, when one particle pushes on another particle. So when you get these areas of high pressure and low pressure that's caused by sound we said that well, what does this word longitudinal mean we talked about that briefly here we said longitudinal waves have um vibrations that occur with in the same direction of the wave whereas transverse is in opposite directions they it goes from 90 degrees out now, both of these types of waves are important. Understanding how these waves work is important, but and understanding, you know, so we're not going to completely ignore transverse waves, even though they're not, um, because ultimately, even though they're still, they're different, they are still both waves. And we're going to talk about what they do and how they work in a second. And we're going to actually use some of the techniques that we use to understand longitudinal waves also apply to transverse waves. Um, let's talk about moving sound. So we're going to start off with this idea at the front. Front? First. <laughs> okay, so particle theory. I wanted to talk about particles for a second. I've been focusing on a lot of GIFs for this, um, for this topic because I think it makes, it makes it a little bit easier to explore. On the Right here it says particles in a medium push on each other, which causes the next particle to move, and so on and so forth. I'd like you to pay attention to this GIF for a second, especially um, um, the best way is to watch an individual particle. Watch as an individual particle doesn't actually move very far. Just like how, um, just like how current in a current, the electric, uh, uh, electrical current, the electrons don't move very far. When you take a sound wave, 
sure the air molecules might move around, but they do go back to where they are. But the wave moves forward. I think that's an important idea. Is that even though the, um, because if you pushed all the air away whenever you talked, you wouldn't be able to breathe after a certain amount of time. So yeah, sure, you move the air particles, but those air particles still move back. But the wave moves forward. How those air particles move forward is the particles in a medium push on each other, which causes the next particle to move, and so on and so forth. Now, particles tend to move into areas of low pressure uh, and away from high pressure. You might think to yourself, well, how does it, why does a particle want to move to a high pressure, from low pressure to high pressure? If you've got a bunch of particles that are all together, they're all going to be crashing into each other and stuff. And essentially, they all are going to eventually push away from each other because they can't push towards each other. So this would be an area of high pressure. If you think about an area of low pressure, in the area of low pressure, there isn't anything in there. So it makes sense for a, the particles to move into that area of low pressure because if, an air, if a particle is here, it can move wherever it wants and not, get in, not bump into anything. So that's why we would say this is an area of low pressure. Another example of this picture is, can be found over here. Again, you can watch this red dot to sort of see how it's moving and you can sort of start to see a little bit like a magic eye. You can see these areas of high pressure moving to the right and that is the sound wave moving. This sound wave is actually being created by this kind of like a syringe like thing. We're going to talk about that in a second. And this graph down the bottom is shows you how these high pressure areas are moving to the right. So that's how we can underuse particle theory. And we've used particle theory a lot at the start of the year. So I guess this is uh, another excuse for me to bring it up. I'm actually going to try my best in this topic to tie back to previous ideas. Because ultimately you guys have learned a lot of physics at this point in time. I can actually rely on you guys knowing what particle theory is. Now, here we've got air, water, and steel. Now, underneath these, it says the speed of sound. Now, the, sp the speed of sound is how quickly a sound happens. If you make a sound, if you bang, if you make a sound and, or you hit on a piece of like, let's just say you've got a, um, I don't know, a pipe running underwater, okay? The pipe contains air. Um, is the pipe, is this, and you hit that pipe with a wrench, is the sound going to move faster through the water, through the steel of the pipe, or through the air inside the pipe? Well, judging by this, it's going to move faster through the steel. Look at that speed, it's going to move 6,000 almost meters per second. Whereas the water is, you know, 1,500 meters per second. And the air is a measly 300 meters per second. Can I get an answer to this question in the chat? Why does sound move faster in steel? Why do you guys think? Take a guess. If you know the answer, just say it. Uh, but yeah, why do you think it moves faster in steel? And this picture is designed to help you understand it too. Uh, I have two answers straight away. Uh, and yeah, the particles are packed. Um, yeah, particles are closer. The particles in steel are closer. Remember, and they are packed more densely. Remember that the whole way that um, the whole way that sound is able to move is by one particle crashing into another particle. So if those particles are packed, jammed right next to each other, then it makes sense that they're gonna, the sound is going to travel really quickly. But with water and air, because the particles aren't packed as closely, it actually takes longer for you to hear it. 
let's think of just some examples of this. Some examples of this were back in the day, if you wanted to know when the like, let's think the first example that I can think of, and this actually does occur to me, is when I'm standing at the train platform, waiting for the train, you know, to show up. Now, what I find interesting when I'm standing at the train platform waiting for the train to show up, I actually feel the train coming closer before I hear the train coming. And the reason I feel the train is I can actually sort of feel the ground shakes just a little bit. Not a lot. It's not like an earthquake. But you can sort of feel and I'm like, oh, I bet the train's coming. Next thing you know, you can start to hear the train. And that's because the, uh, the sound is going to travel faster through the ground through, and it's going to travel faster through the steel in the, in the, um, and the metal in the, in the um, train tracks than through the air. So you will feel it coming before you see it. Uh, and yeah, so and you can, there are a lot of things that you can feel, like you, sometimes you can feel you've got um, a bass um, subwoofer or something, you can feel it um, before you can hear it. Um, and yeah, it's, there's a lot of, um, water is also very quick for things to travel through. So if you're under water, you can hear it, but it's very unlike, I don't know, you don't do a lot of listening when you're underwater. water. But definitely, like, you can often feel something. And sometimes what people would do is they put the ear to the ground. If you put your ear to the ground, you can actually hear things a lot further away because the, the um, you know, things travel really quickly. By the way, this is one of the reasons why sonic booms happen. So sonic booms, I'm not sure if, uh, if you've heard of, is when you've got a plane that's moving really quickly and it creates a sonic boom. But one of the other, probably other things you might be familiar with is if you've ever heard a whip crack. Now whip crack uh, or a sonic boom occurs because the object is moving faster than the speed of sound. So whenever it makes a sound, because it's moving faster than the speed of sound, the sound can't catch up to it. So it's making sound. I actually don't fully understand it, but it's actually making sound faster than it's moving faster than the sound can catch up to it so therefore all the sound comes out in one pocket or burst and that's why it causes a sonic boom or in a whip it's called the whip whip crack you're moving that whip so quickly that at the end that it's actually moving faster than the speed of sound so therefore all of the sound that that makes has to come out at one point and so you end up with a whip crack um, you can create um, sonic booms as well if, and it's really easy to do in air because the speed of the sound in air is sort of slow. It would be a lot harder to do a sonic, like to do a, um, to break the sound barrier in water because it has to be going like five times the speed. So yeah, it's, which is pretty high speed. Yeah, like that's what a sonic boom is. So. We've talked now that uh, sound is all about movement of particles and the density of those particles actually makes a difference. So now let's talk about, let's go back to this picture. Let's talk about the parts of the sound wave that we understand. We understand that there are areas of high pressure. Now these areas of high pressure where we've got areas of lots and lots of particles. You could think about an area of high pressure. You could think about areas of high population density. You could think about a high um, air density in these regions. But each of these areas of high density is sandwiched between areas of low density. 
there are lots of areas of low density between these areas of high density. Because it makes sense, right? All of these particles, the reason this is low is because all the particles have moved away from the middle. The reason these are high is because all the particles have moved towards it. The particles don't want to be there, they would rather be out. But the reason they are pushed there is because of the waves. So we can actually take this information and we could actually plot it. We could plot the areas of high density and we could actually plot the areas of low density. We could call this, we could call this, um, yeah, we could call this, uh, this is pressure. In this case, this would be distance. And then we could use this line here to represent normal pressure. So some point, like this point here, this area here is a pretty well, probably a normal pressure, whereas this one here is probably a lot lower. So we've got this curve here. By the way, does anyone know what the name of this uh, type of curve is called? This type of wave? Does anyone know this, the special name for this and they want to say it in the um, chat. What is that called? What is that type of wave called? This type of graph, it has a name. It doesn't have to be exact, it's just one of an approximate name. What do we what do we call these kinds of graphs? It's a sign graph. Yeah, thank you, um, anonymous person. This is a sign graph. If you had said cosine graph, then I would have accepted that. But yeah, we can now look at, even though this is a longitudinal wave, we can still sort of look at the pressure and sort of get an idea of this as a bit of a, um, as a, even though it's not a transverse wave, we can still apply our understanding of sine curves to this wave. Now we've already done this sort of thing before, but in because we're going to do it again. We actually already did this, but we're going to do it again. And also if you've already done this in methods or special, then you're well ahead of everyone else. Um, or actually before I get into talking about the wave, Let's talk a bit more about this compression or at this high pressure and low pressure. Here we've got an example of a drum. Drums also um, work in that they do the same thing. And a drum, this is how you can actually create these types of waves. As the drum is pushed out, it pushes all the air particles together. As this drum is sucked in, the air will move in, it will create a little area of low pressure. So as it pushes out, think about it, if it's got like all these particles here, if you push this drum out, all these particles are going to get pushed together into, into all into these particles here. So you're going to have a you can create an area of high pressure. And we actually call that area of high pressure an area of compression. The opposite of the area of compression is this area here. It's called an area of rarefication. And the, this drum works by when it gets, obviously it's, um, it's an elastic sort of thing. So it's going to bounce if you hit it, it's going to push inwards, you're going to create the opposite, an area of verification, area of low pressure, because the air molecules are going to move into that hole that you've just created. So this is how you can make a sound with a drum. A drum is just a moving membrane which squashes the air molecules together or allows the air molecules to expand out. This is one of the reasons as well drums are so loud, because they're so simple. Of course, you can, if you have, were able to create this moving membrane with a um, electronic system, you would have a speaker. 
So this is a slowed down version of a speaker. And what a speaker does is it moves, uses a magnet to push a cone outwards. When it pushes it outwards, it creates an area of high pressure. When it moves inwards, it creates an area of low pressure. And so then that can be used to send out specific sound waves, which allow us to hear what's going on. I've just put here these terms here in case I use them at, at more than once. So compression is an area of high pressure. It's where all the air molecules are close together. Let me write that down actually. Air molecules Now I'm going to use the word air here, but obviously um, I want you guys to start being aware that when, because usually when we listen to sound, we listen to it in air, but obviously these uh, sound waves, would, they would still be the same in water as well, uh, or metal. It's just like I use the word air because it's a bit easier. Rarification, if you think about the word rare, rare meaning few, it's areas of low pressure. So air molecules far apart, or they are rare. There aren't as many of them. That's what low pressure means. So that's all you need to make a sound, an area of high pressure and area of low pressure. Whenever you have an object that's moving in and out, it will make a sound. Um, you need to move sometimes a lot of air very quickly to get a decent amount of sound. But yeah, whenever you move air molecules around, you get some form of sound. Okay, so next up, I'm gonna plug my charger in because I'm running on charge. This is what I was getting at understanding the understanding the part of a wave now we've already done this in lesson 38 and we actually did this when we looked at the voltage cycle and as i said you've probably already done something similar to this in um methods or specialists but if not let's do this now the first term that we're going to refer to is the amplitude Now, the amplitude of a wave is how high or low the wave gets from its normal level or its origin. So obviously, when we talk about the amplitude, we're talking about how high the pressure gets from normal pressure or how low the pressure gets from normal pressure. Okay? Remember, it's whenever you create, um, whenever you use sound, you're not just creating areas of high pressure, you're also creating areas of low pressure. And that creates an amplitude. Amplitude means how high up it is. Um, yeah, and when we did this, we did this with voltage. We talked about how this is, you know, the voltage cycle and stuff like that, but it's really cool. Wavelength has this weird symbol. I always think his symbol looks like a drunk H. I always think this looks like a H that got really like drunk one day and he's like, oh, I'm not feeling so good and it turns into, but that's actually probably looks more like a backwards H. But yeah, the technical term for this is lambda. Now, wavelength or lambda is the distance between identical points on two consecutive waves, e.g. crest to crest. If you look at this, between here and here, we have one full wave. You could take another point too. You could take this point here and this point here. If you look at this point here, the wave is going up and to the right. At this point here, the wave is going up and to the right. Um, why not this point? Because this point, the wave's not going up and to the right, it's going down to the right. So this represents one wavelength. This is a new wavelength. And the re how you can tell a wavelength is you look for two points that are exactly the same. 
Now it's easier to actually look for the two maximum points or two minimum points or whatever. And that's what a wavelength is. Wavelength is exactly what it says. It's a length. So it's measured in it's measured in centimeters or meters or whatever. It's a distance. Okay, so when you think about wavelength, I want you to think about a distance or something. Now, when we talk about different waves, we can talk about different wavelengths. Sound is usually wavelengths of about centimeters, whereas radio waves are about meters. Microwaves are, well, exactly as the name gives you, micro. So they're like a thousandth of a millimeter and so on and so forth. Light rays are nanometers, but that's their wavelength. So wavelength is just a distance in meters, kilometers, whatever. Frequency, or F, is the number of waves that move past the point in a given time. The frequency is in hertz, which means per a second. Now, we've already talked about hertz briefly. Again, going back to lesson 38, we said that the cycle, the speed that it takes for one wave uh, um, to move, the amount of waves that move past in, um, in electricity is 240. So there are 240 waves go past the starting point every second. That's a lot. In this, yeah, you will see something like 240. You can even see 440 hertz. So 440 waves pass in one second. We've also talked about period as well. Period is the time taken for one wave to pass a point. It's the inverse of frequency, and it's measured in seconds. So let's say it takes like one second for a wave to pass. Or maybe so let's just say five seconds. It's a particularly long wave, it takes five seconds. Then you can say, well, that is the period, five seconds. And then you can say, well, how many, if you've got, if it takes half a second for a wave to get through, well, that means you can actually use this formula here to calculate the frequency. The frequency is one over the period. We're going to do an, an example of this on the next page, but just before we do it, let's just say that you've got, um, it takes half a second, 0 0.5 seconds for the wave to move. So it takes 0 0.5 seconds then that means that you've got one over 0 0.5 equals two hertz, which means you expect to see two waves every second, which makes sense. It takes half a second for one wave, one second for two waves, and that means two waves per second. That's how you would use that. Now I'm going to change the slide a minute unless do you guys need more time on this slide there is a lot of information on the slide i'm going through it quickly because i assume that you guys have seen a lot of this stuff before if you haven't um let me know feel free to download this slide look at it later on ask me some questions about it but we're going to do we're going to do some stuff we're going to move on are we good to move on Okay, I'm moving on. We've got an example here. Orchestras use middle A as, um, as four, four, uh, 440 hertz as a, stand, as a standard. What is the period of this note? All right, so let's work this out. So period equals one on frequency. Hold on, that's not the equation I gave you. Doesn't matter. You can swap these around because it's one over the other. So period equals one on the frequency equals one on 440. One divided by 440 
is 2.3 times 10 to the power of negative 3 seconds. Or just 0 0.0023 seconds. So it's very, very, very quick. Like the if you play just a single note, it's gonna, you know, just a single wave. It's gonna, it's not gonna need a lot. If you play that for one second, you expect 440. If you play the note of A for one second, you expect 440 um, sound waves to hit your ear. If you play it for 0 0.0023 seconds, um, you will only expect one sound wave to hit your ear. You don't have to write the stuff down the bottom. And just so FYI, if you're a music nerd, which I'm not, I don't think there is any, but there is an interesting story about the arguments that went on deciding this fact. Back in the 19th, in the 1860s or 1920s, I think, there are a lot of orchestras around the world that were like, no, we think that uh, A should be 432 hertz. It's like, no, A should be 437 hertz. Some people were even thinking A should be 450 hertz. And there's lots of arguments in why, and the French got very upset. But now we sort of all agree that A should be 440 hertz. It's an interesting story. But yeah, this is just a quick example on how you can convert one to another. I'll give you guys a second to jot this down if you want to. If you don't want to, again, if you don't want to take notes, it's fine. If you want to, if you just want to write down the working out, then that's cool too. <clears throat> okay. So that's just how you can convert from frequency to period and from period to frequency. And what these words mean is that um, frequency is how many waves pass in one second. So, and whereas period is how long it takes one wave to go past. Sometimes frequency makes a little bit more sense. It's like, oh yeah, I can imagine 440 packets. I can imagine 440 of these, you know, I can imagine 440 of those passing through every second. Whereas someone, yeah, whereas for longer waves, you might be like, oh, yeah, it takes one second for this for one wave. Okay, that makes sense. Now, I wanted to talk to you guys a bit about frequency, and this is starting, we're going to talk more about this later on. But this is starting to get us to link some of these ideas about the physics to the sound. Frequency in sound is linked to pitch. Obviously, frequency in uh, frequency of light rays is linked to something different to frequency in um, water waves is linked to something different. But in sound, frequency is linked to pitch. So high frequency or high pitch is like a violin or a squeal. So high pitch is when you speak really, really high and you got like a really teeny sounding voice. And that's what you call it when you've got a high frequency voice. And you guys might know, have little brothers and little sisters with high frequency, high pitch voices. And you're like, oh, it hurts your ears. That's what a high, that means that the sound waves coming out of your little sister look like this they look like this high um they look like these high really compressed high frequency things if you think about um a whistle you know if i had a whistle i would blow it if you think of a whistle that's what it's it's a high pitch it's this really like ear piercing sound the opposite of high frequency is low frequency. Now, low frequency is when you speak with a deep voice. A low frequency 
or low pitch is like a double bass or a deep voice. This is like your father's voice and maybe your voice after you've had um, too much, you know, where after puberty, males' voices tend to drop and their voices tend to go down. Of course, it's <clears throat> not normal for male. Sometimes males' voice will normal over puberty. It's not a quick and easy fix, and you sometimes get voice cracks because they go from high pitch to low pitch, and it just bit cracks because their voice box isn't used to doing that. But yeah, low frequency or low pitch is when you've got and is deep sound. Whereas high frequency is high pitch. And I wanted to do this slide here because I thought it was important to talk about, well, we're talking about frequency. It's a good chance to talk about, well, what do different frequencies sound like? Is there a different sound? And yes, there is a different sound. Um, now, um, and of course, but the thing as well is frequency, wavelength, and all these other things are also all linked together. <clears throat> and they're linked together via this next slide, which has got something on it that's pretty important. It's got the um, equation that we're going to use a lot, and that's called the speed of a wave. Now, the speed of a wave. Now, there's a couple of ways that I thought that I could explain this to you, but I thought that I would start with just the formulas. The speed of a wave or the velocity of a wave is a uh, velocity of anything is distance over time okay doesn't matter what we're talking about whether we're talking about motion or we're talking about a wave you've got a distance over time now when we talk about waves we talk about distance we want to talk about the distance of one wave and when we want to talk about time we're talking about the time taken for one wave to pass. We've actually already done that. The distance of one wave is lambda or the wavelength. Remember, this is measured in like centimeters. And T or the period is the time taken for one wave to move. And that's given in seconds. So if you take lambda, the distance that it moves, the distance of the wavelength, and lambda, the time taken, you can get the speed of the wave. To be honest, though, we don't usually use this formula. We actually prefer to substitute f equals 1 on t, if you substitute that into that equation, you can get to this formula here. V equals F lambda. The frequency of the wave multiplied by the wavelength gives you the speed of the wave. And this, and notice how I'm saying the speed of the wave. You know, the speed of a wave. This can be any wave. That includes light waves and um, water waves if you know how big the waves are and how many of them pass through in a particular second you can work out how fast they're moving let's look at this animation on the right here so this animation on the right ticks up from time to time now i want you guys to look at when this reaches let's look at something let's look at an example here let's wait for this to get to zero i think it's about now so we know that the dot was like this at this point okay 10 seconds later we've gone through about half of the wavelength and then after another Bang, it lines up there. So it takes 20 seconds for the wave to move.
which means that if it takes 20 seconds to wait for move, then that means that frequency is going to be 1 on 20. Frequency is equal to that, which is, this is our period. So our period is 20 seconds. Or, and our frequency is 1 on 20, which is 0 0.04. Uh, I think. No, I think I got that wrong. Sorry, give me a sec. One zero point zero five. Whoopsie. Zero point zero five hertz. Now let's look at the wavelength. So how can we measure the wavelength? What we're gonna do is we're gonna wait bang there and there. So the wavelength looks like if you measure from crest to crest or from bang bang it is in this case 25 meters so our wavelength is 25 meters so therefore v equals f lambda equals 0 0.05 hertz times 25 meters gives us 1.25 meters per second and that's the wave that's the speed of the wave that's how quickly this wave is moving to the right it's moving uh, 1.25 meters every second. Let's use, look at a different example now. If we are, has anyone got any questions on this slide, any queries, any confusions? So just remember, wave, speed of a wave, speed is always distance over time. Our distance measurement for waves is our wavelength. And our time measurement for waves is our period. So it's just um, wavelength over period, or if you replace wave period with f, v equals f lambda. Let's look at a different example here. This is another music example. We're going to keep coming back to music because it's going to be one of our important like linking points. A trumpet plays the note middle C, which is 262 hertz. Okay, 262 hertz. That is a frequency. F equals 262. The trumpet is played in air, and that has a speed of sound of 343 meters per second. First things first. We know that it's 343 because if we went back here, we said that the fastest that, as, uh, that it can move is 343 meters per second. That's how quickly a sound wave can move through something, through air. If it was play, if it was in water, it might be a bit of a different story. But believe it or not, you can't play a trumpet underwater. So, what is the wavelength in so hertz, meters per second? What is the wavelength of this note? V equals F lambda. Therefore, if we want to know the wavelength, V divided by F is going to give us lambda. Lambda equals V over F equals 343 divided by 262. Send me. 343 divided by 262 gives us 1.3 we'll go with 1.31 meters or 131 centimeters that's how we can convert using that formula if we knew the period if it's but usually the 
the reason I'm giving you V equals F lambda is because usually when we refer to uh, sound waves, we usually refer to the frequency. Now, 343 hertz, you could then start to think about that. Is that going to be a high pitch sound or a low pitch sound? Is that going to be a squeaky, or is it going to be a, you know, sort of sound? Sorry, I, I'm, yeah, I'm making dumb sounds. I apologize. But is it going to be a high squeaky, squeaky, squeaky sound? Or, yeah. And you can sort of start to sort of say, okay, also well, squeaky sounds, they're going to have short wavelengths. So if you're going to look here, high pitch frequencies, they're going to be short wavelengths. Look, so this is a lot shorter, whereas this is a lot longer. Whereas low frequencies have long wavelengths. Obviously, you have to be careful. You have to be careful when we're talking about when we're talking about this, you have to make sure that you're talking about the same speed. Obviously, a high if you took a high pitch sound and put it in water then it might sound different to a high pitch sound played through air. So yeah, be careful about that. But yeah, that's how you would do this question with regards to a trumpet. Uh, v equals F lambda. You could do the opposite. You could calculate the speed. And usually that's what they'll do is because we know that we are, this is a fixed number. So what they'll do is they'll say, well, if I play a sound, which is a frequency of, 500 hertz, what wavelength would that have? Now, the part that always used to confuse me about, um, about sound, and this is one of the ones that I discovered really recently, I actually discovered it when I was teaching electronics, was I used to really not get how does sound and wavelengths, how does like, how do I know that uh, middle C is equal to 262 hertz. That middle bit on a piano, that the key of C is right in the middle of the piano, that's 343, that's 262 hertz. I'm like, well, how do they know that? How do these two things equate? And then I found out that this stuff has been mapped a long time ago. Let me show you. These are the notes. If you look here, our answer to this was 131 centimeters. If you actually look here, the answer is actually 138, 31.87. But that's because they use a slightly, I said 262 hertz. The actual is actually 261.63 hertz. And that's a C4. C4 is middle C. And that's middle C on a piano middle C on a violin, middle C on a um, flute. They're all the same things. Um, A4, remember I said that this is the one that all orchestras set, tune their musical to. This is middle A. And this is what you would refer to, I believe, if I've got my music knowledge correct, as an octave. C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and we're back to C again. Now, and if you look here, as the frequency goes up, as you get more and more and more, so the wavelength goes down. So this is like got, you know, this is here, whereas, you know, this one here is going to look more like this. And whereas this one's going to look more like this. And so on the frequency, the frequency goes up, but the wavelength goes down. The wavelength gets shorter and shorter. So this is our wavelength here. Now, um, 
I'm only going to talk about this very briefly here, but I want to see, I want you guys to see if you guys are, if I've got any like amazing, super crazy visual people. I want you guys, and this is a bit of a clue what's coming up soon. I like, now, both of these are referred to as C. This is middle C, this is a higher version of C. They're both C, it's just this is one octave up. I want you guys to look at these numbers for a second. Do you guys notice anything interesting going from this number to this number? We're actually going to talk about this later on. So if you don't see it now, if you don't see it now, I'm not going to tell you the answer, but if you don't see it now, don't worry, I'll talk about it later. But look at those numbers and have a think to yourself. I'm not going to actually tell you the answer. Have a look at, yeah, no, someone said the higher frequency is a shorter wavelength. That's correct. But I'm not getting you guys to look, I'm not going to, I'm, gonna, I'm not getting you guys to look at the, um, at the, I want you to look at these two. They're both versions of C. And they have something in common. I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm going to let you guys maybe think about it. Okay. It might be a bit easier. Oh, pardon me if I show you. Pardon me. I'm just going to go out of this for a second. It might be a bit easier if I showed you. Um, Let me see if I can find where I was again. Um, pardon me, I'm just going to quickly. Frequency to notes. Might be easier for me to show you if instead of looking at the C's, we look at A. Let me just bring this up here. Share, whoopsies. I want to share this. This is the same website that I got this information from. Pardon me. Can you guys see that? What I like, yeah, I would, ooh, someone's figured it out. Look at A440. I don't know, for some reason my, my, my um, tablet's died on me just then. Look at, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go through it yet. I'm going to go through this probably on Friday, but look at A4. And then look at A5. What do you notice that's interesting about the frequency or about the wavelength? And then let's look at A3. A3 is um that's a sharp a3 if i just do a little bit if i just push the thing up here there we go here's a3 here's a4 here's a5 there's an interesting pattern but i'm not going to tell you what um what there is an in, I'm not going to go through it today, but there's an interesting pattern. You can see it. Um, Kelvin's got it. Is the uh, no, Kang's got it. Sorry, as well. And, and yeah, so uh, I'm not going to tell you what the answer is, but yeah. And if you look at that, that same pattern also applies to all of the C's as well. It might not look like it does, 
but it does. If you go from C4 to C5, there is an interesting pattern here. I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm just going to leave it open for the meantime. Yeah. Um, and yeah, Kang, you did get it correctly. Um, but you can sort of, hopefully you can see how this would be extended. But I'm not going to, um, yeah, and if you've got that, that's great. Now we go back to the lesson. I think there's like one more. Yeah, there is. There's one more idea I wanted to talk to you guys about, which I've got about. I'm going to quickly go through it. Um, pardon me. Diffraction of a sound wave. So we've talked a bit about now the movement of, we talked about three ideas here so far. We talked about the parts of a sound wave. And that, well, no, we're talking about, yeah, two ideas so far. First, we talked about how a sound wave moves by pressure. And then we talked a bit about how a sound wave moves via, um, the frequency and the wavelength. But this is the last thing I wanted to talk about with how a sound wave moves, which is about diffraction. This is a 3D kind of understanding of sound waves. Sound waves and all waves actually undergo this idea of diffraction. Now what diffraction is, is diffraction is the bending of a wave as they pass around an object or an obstacle. So if you grab a look here, if you look at this um, between A and B, as the, um, as the wave moves forward, it will bend around the shape. And essentially, you can hear it. Now, um, if there are areas where the sound waves don't get penetrated, they're called shadows. So you can actually think about this, right? If you've got someone, um, uh, if you've got someone talking, uh, if you are standing against a wall, you can still hear people talking on the other side of that wall because the sound goes around the wall; it can bounce. Okay, you can and I. Uh, yeah, sound can move around a wall and around objects. The amount of wave bends is dependent on the wavelength. Longer waves, longer wavelength sounds bend more. Now, longer wavelengths, right? Or um, longer wavelengths or low frequency. Bend more. Now, the, what are those? They're the bass sounds. And if you guys probably know quite well, that if you're playing a music, if you're playing music, you can, if someone's playing music in a different room, you can hear the bass of that music before you can hear the lyrics. I can, like, uh, anytime someone bloody plays Billie Eilish, I can tell they're playing Billie Eilish way before I can hear Billie, Eilish, uh, Billie Eilish's voice because of the, the beat, you know, the, um, because of the, the thump and bass. Because it's got a, such a, you know, um, such a really strong bass sound, you can tell what it is. You don't even need to be in the same room. Um, and the object also does play a role, though. So if you look here, right, um, there is a formula you can use. If there, if you've got a very, very small gap, if you've got a very long wavelength, it will def it will spread out more. It will diffract or bend more because it'll come out. Whereas if you've got a high, if you've got a smaller wavelength, so if you look at this, this is a lot shorter wavelength, it's not going to bend as much. But the same is also true of the object. If you had a very, very small object, right? It's, uh, well, yeah, sorry. 
if you have a very, very, very small gap, right? Even if you've got like a really long wavelength, only a little bit of sound is going to be able to get through and bend out. So therefore, lambda on D is a, if, if lambda on D is small. So if the wavelength is large and the gap is very, 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 very large, then there's very little diffraction. There's very little bending. But if the gap is very, very small, then you will, in this case like this, where the gap is, um, where the gap is really small, you will see a lot of bending. There'll be a lot of spreading out. This occurs in light as well, by the way. This is why you see a rainbow because different wavelengths, like red wavelengths versus the yellow wavelength, bend differently. And that's why water creates a rainbow. But yeah, you can hear this with sound all the time. If you've got a deep thump and bass, you can hear that because it can bend a lot easier than the high pitches. Because if you know high pitch, high, low frequency sounds just don't bend as much. Here's a better picture. And I feel like I should have given a bit of an epilepsy warning because God damn it, this is a bit, but I know none of you guys have it. You can tell that as this wave hits this small gap, you can see a large amount of bending, a large amount of diffraction as that bends outwards. All right. Now, so that's all that I wanted to talk to you guys about. Let me just recover back. Let me just go back over the basics. We talked about three main ideas. The first main idea that we talked about today was how particles move using the particle theory. And therefore, using the particle theory, we can say why sound moves faster in air than steel. We talked about how sound is just a series of high and low pressure areas. And that high and low pressure can be modeled as a wave. It has a wavelength and an amplitude. The areas of the high pressure are called compression. The areas of low pressure are called rarefication. Not only does it have a wavelength, it also has a frequency depending on how quickly it's moving. Combining the frequency and the wavelength together, we can get a way to measure the speed of the wave. If you know the speed, of, but if you already know the speed of the wave, you can use that to find out the wavelength. We know that higher pitch sounds, which sound squeaky, have a higher frequency or a lower wavelength. And then we finished up by sort of talking about diffraction, saying lower pitch sounds or deeper sounds bend more, which is why you can hear the bass of a, the bass of music coming from a car when you're not even in the car, because the the bass can diffract around and get to your ear, whereas the high pitch of the, the guitar or the singers can't get to your ear. So those are the three main ideas. 